great. So it's been really fun for us to do um, this series of in-depth classes on the villages of the Cote d'Or. Uh, it's been a great opportunity, uh, not only for us to look into some of the complexities of these terroirs, the producers, the villages themselves, um, and then, you know, but also to pass that information along to our guests. So uh, as we've been going through these series, one thing that I've mentioned at the big start of classes is that these, uh, the slides that we present are very complex. They have a lot of inf information on them. We'll skip over some of it, um, especially today because there are 55 Premier Crews in Chisanya. There's a lot, right? A lot, a lot. 300 hectares of vines being made within this village. So we have a lot to discuss, but the reason that we do include it in the slide is so that you have that in your follow-up information later on. Um, you know, I, I like to be clear that, you know, and transparent, I don't consider myself to be a Burgundy expert, um, but it has been really great to learn how to focus my studies on such a complex and renowned wine producing region in the world, because I think you really have to have a basic understanding and then approach each village um, with sort of an open mind, right? And how to seek out the producers and the best plots of land within each individual village. You also start to notice that we see names repeated in Burgundy, which is quite common. And I think it just really helps us to understand how to decipher labels and understand what we can expect from different types of terroir. Maybe even when we have the same vineyard names in multiple villages like Cairo, and we think about even if we don't know through research the style of that Cairo village of, let's say, you know, Chisonia Mont Rocher, we know that Cairo means small stones, and that can give us a kind of a glimpse into what the style of the wine might be. So, lots of fun things. So, today um, we will kind of, as I kind of mentioned before, we'll definitely uh, take some time to go through all of these Premier Crews and the Grand Crews that we're going to be discussing today. But also, um, we really wanna make sure that we get out of here on time today and you have this information for later on. So please ask questions if you like. Um, you can take yourself off mute. You can pop a question into the chat box and we'll discuss the wines. Um, if you did purchase wines from Corkbeth at the end. So please begin to enjoy those now. You don't have to wait for me. Um, the purpose of these classes is not as much of a guided tasting as to give you the information to be able to seek out and enjoy these wines outside of pork buds, right? So let's start looking at France and then we'll start spotlighting in to the village, right? So just kind of a, this is a very basic overview of the major wine regions of France. Obviously, they're not all in this particular map, but you can kind of see out of the really major regions, Champagne, Loire Valley, Bordeaux, the Rhone, Burgundy, Alsace, you know, Burgundy is quite small. Um, and today we're specifically focusing on a single village within the southern part of the Cote d'Or um, down here in the kind of golden slope, right? We have uh, Chablis up here, we have the Côte d'Or with the Côte des Nuits to the north, the Côte des Bone to the south, and then we move into the Côte Chalonnet, Maconnet, and Beaujolais, of course, as well. It'd be fun to do the villages of Beaujolais, but I think that's all kind of in one class can be done, like in like an in-depth Beaujolais, right, with the cruise. So as we look here at the Côte des Bone, the southern part of the Côte d'Or, we can see that uh, we have fewer Grand Cru vineyards within uh, the, the Côte de Bonne. So we have these around the hill of Corton here, Corton, Charlemagne, Corton, Charlemagne. And then down here, we have the group of, I kind of call them like the, the Mont Rocher, right? The clutch of the Mont Rocher. And we have a lot of premier and village or village level vineyards within the Côte de Bonne. Uh, this is an, an area that's known for the quality of its white wine, but we produce a lot of reds, and a lot of the reds are quite good within not just the Côte Bone, but also in Chisania, which we'll discuss today. It's going to be quite different from our class on Pouligny last week, where we're really talking about a village that is almost um, a monoculture for Chardonnay. Not quite in Pouligny, but almost, right? 
So here, let's look at the village of Chisanya. You have the village here, um, the Guang Cru, two of which it shares with the village of Pouligny Mont Roche, uh, Mont Roche and Batard Mont Roche, and one uh, Guang Cru that it has in its entirety, completely within the boundaries of Chosanya, and that's Creole Batard Mont Roche. So we'll talk about those three Grand Cru today. And then let's take a look. You know, I think it helps to see these maps and begin to visualize uh, the landscape that we might be seeing within Chosanya Mont Roche. The sort of mustard yellow color is the Premier Cruise. There's a lot listed on here. We're going to go into this in a moment. Um, now the Premier Cruise are primarily on the hillside. Uh, the kind of lighter pink, these are the village level vineyards. So they're not as, as prestigious as the Premier Cruise. The Premier Cruise are not as prestigious as the Grand Cruise. The village vineyards tend to be located on sort of the lower slopes or even flat land. Now, even though we think of Chisanya Mont Rocher as a white wine village, the village level vineyards are typically better suited to the production of red wine coming from Pinot Noir. Now, the Premier Cru level vineyards um, are suited to the production of both. When we get higher up on the hill with thinner soil, more pebble, they tend to be better terroir for white wine. But some of the lower vineyards, even at the Premier Cru level, are better for the production of red. So we'll discuss that. So we have some of the village um, and the Premier Cru uh, vineyard that are adjacent to the village level vineyard, the Pouligny Mont Rocher, right? Um, and also there's some Premier Cru vineyards over here from Pouligny as well. It's a little bit different in the concept that most of these Premier Cru do not abut a Grand Cru, which is what we see with a lot of the villages in the Côte des Nuits. You can think that over here near Morjo, we tend to have um, a focus on both red and white. These are broader, more textural styles of wine with heavier soils on a lighter slope than we have up here towards the north. Grand Rochotes, uh, we talk about Caire, La Romanie, all tend to do really well for the mineral driven styles of white wine. And then we have this group of Premier Cru that are over here near the, uh, the Grand Cru as well, which we'll talk about. In terms of the red Premier Cru style, which we're gonna talk about, Close St. John tends to be one of the best Premier Cru's for um, a very balanced style of red wine coming from Chosanya. I think maps are always a huge help for me. So you can actually see the vineyard sort of overlaid um, a Google Earth, a Google Maps here, Google Earth, Google Earth Maps, I guess you would say. Here we see um, the Grand Cru vineyard of Mont Rocher split half and half between Pouligny and Chisanya. More maps. All right, so let's get into Chisanya. Um, just like Pouligny, Chassagne appended the name of its most important Grand Cru vineyard, Mont Rocher, in 1879, just shortly after Pouligny did. Uh, relatively today, I would say, by comparison to some of the other villages within the Côte de Beaume, like uh, Pouligny or Merceau, it's a little bit more unknown to wine drinkers and maybe even to other residents of the Côte de Beaume itself. It's the most southern of the Côte d'Or's major wine villages. Uh, there are other villages further south. We have Santenay, we have Morange, before we move into, of course, um, the Côte Chalonnet. But they really tend to keep to themselves. Uh, the producers in the village are much more insular. And we're going to see this as we get to talking about uh, the surnames located in the village too, which can be confusing in and of itself. We tend to use uh, the producer name in Burgundy as a beacon, right? Almost kind of like um, a lighthouse as for which wine to really seek out because we know that there are producers that have such a huge history of uh, production within their family of that collective knowledge of the land that's been passed down from generation to generation. Well, in the village of Chassagna, the family tree of the Collines, the Moray, the Gagnard, the Pios is so huge um, that it can be a little bit confusing. So we know that Chassagna is known for the quality of its white wines. 
Um, and the white wines fetch far higher prices. However, a lot of the soils, especially as we mentioned at the village level, are better suited to red wine. So if we're talking about white, we're talking about Chardonnay, we're talking about red, of course, we're talking about Pinot Noir. Now, aside from the Grand Cru, which are classified for white grapes only, for Chardonnay only, uh, the vineyard classification of Burgundy does not really take into account the soil and the grape color. So in Chisania, uh, at the village or the premier cru level, you can make either white or red. You can produce Chardonnay or you can produce Pinot Noir. You can call that premier cru or village level, right? We'll talk a little bit about that. In 1972, and this is how much things have shifted, production was about 62% red to 38% white, but by 2007 listed as 37% red, red to 63% white. So we really are seeing, even on the kind of lower slopes that are better suited to the production of red, producers are pulling up Pinot you know, and planting Chardonnay. It makes more money than Pinot Noir does. So I think, um, you know, Chassagne Rouge or Pinot Noir is a really fantastic um, alternative to Cote de Nuit reds. And it can be much less expensive, especially on wine lists, especially if you're traveling within France. Uh, we still produce slightly more red than white at the village level, but now today, 78% of Premier Cru wine that is produced is white. And we know that we share the Grand Cru of Mont Rocher and Batard Mont Rocher with Pouligny, but it had the entirety of Creot Batard Mont Rocher Grand Cru within its borders, as we mentioned before. Um, I'll oftentimes, uh, you know, shorten the term. You'll hear Batard. I mean Batard Mont Rocher Grand Cru. You'll hear me say Creote. I mean Creote Batard Mont Rocher Grand Cru, but if we continuously list out the entire name um, as we're speaking, we'll never get through this class. So just keep that in mind. We might talk about the uh, Grand Cru's of Pouligny as well that are not shared with Chassagne. So that would include Chevalier Mont Rocher and Bienvenu Batard Mont Rocher. So you'll hear me re refer to those as Chevalier and uh, Bienvenu as well. The Premier Cru that you saw form a solid band from the border of Santenay in the south to saint Aubin, which is uh, just a little bit to the west. A lot of producers that make wine in Chassagne and Pouligny also make wine in either Santenay or saint Aubin. Nearly everything on the mid slope and the higher slope is designated as Premier Cru. Uh, you'll notice when we go back to the map that you do see some village level vineyards that are higher up on the slope. The higher Premier Cru vineyards like La Romani, Grand Rochot, and Caire have a lot of acidity and a lot of power. And the lower slope will produce, like Morjo, the Premier Cru, a much rounder, fleshier wine. And the one near the border of Pouligny, uh, Chenevolt Blanchot de Sous uh, in Tenier, have a little bit more, if not all, of uh, Pouligny's kind of fruit and slightly floral robustness to them as well. As we mentioned before, depending on the publication, there are anywhere between 19 and 55 Premier Cru's in the village of Chassagne. Why is this? Because Chassagne is very complex and many of the larger Premier Cru's can be subdivided into smaller LUD and the producer, depending on where the vineyard is located, can choose the option of labeling their wine up to three different ways. So the only other place that I really know of this being prevalent within Burgundy is in Chablis, where many of the Premier Cru can label as a neighboring Premier Cru if that neighboring Premier Cru is better known. So why would a producer do this? Because you might think that Morjo is more noticeable than noticeable on a label than Boudriot. Right. So we classify a lot of the larger premier crews as smaller premier crews or vice versa. So maybe if, for example, you're in Morjo, but you're in a smaller premier crew, you might tend to think that that smaller premier crew within the larger premier crew Morjo does create or craft a different style. So you might list it by that label. We'll get more into that. 
It can be a little bit more difficult to characterize the white wines of Chisania, um, probably due to the fact that they don't have quite the, the fleshiness of Marceau. They don't have quite the completeness of Pouligny. Um, they're not quite as aromatic or floral as we see in, in Pouligny. And this might have to do with the fact that so much of the village level soil that's better suited to red wine is planted to Chardonnay. So we might see better wine coming out of the village if it was in fact Pinot Noir rather than Chardonnay at the village level. In the 70s, the 80s, and 90s, producers like Ramonet, which is still one of my favorites, Milan and Gagnard, uh, tended to produce uh, these sort of richer, unctuous, and oaky styles of wine. But the newer wave producer, kind of the younger guard today, is, is producing definitely a more mineral, racy, sort of razor sharp and refined style. So that would be Pierre-Yves Colline of Colline Moray, Alec Moreau of Bernard Moreau, Vincent Dancer are all great examples. And then to talk for a moment about the concept of red chassagne, right? We should be drinking more. We should be drinking a lot more red chassagne. Um, they have prominent tannins. They tend to be lighter in body, but a little bit firmer um, and more rustic in their tannin structure on the palate, but they have this really beautiful peppery characteristic. They can be gamey and earthy. They might have a little bit of an herbal or sort of resinous quality to them as well um, that can really tell you that this red wine is coming from Chassagne itself. Um, so Clos St. John, which we'll talk about, uh, Clos de la Boudriot and parts of Morgeau are really suited to the production of these red wines. We're gonna get into that. So let's start. So prior, we've kind of done the Grand Cru at the end, um, but there's so many premier crews to focus on. And because we were able to talk about Mont Rocher and Batard Mont Rocher last week, I think it's really great to start with them at the beginning this time. So let's just start with the best of them all. Um, you know, I'm kind of almost disappointed in a way that we did Pouligny last week, because when I think that many times Pouligny is called the greatest white wine commune on earth, or the fact that Raj Parr said, said um, if Burgundy were a poker game, Pouligny got dealt the royal flesh, you know, kind of paints Chassagne as being inferior. But this is, of course, not true because it contains two, half of both two Grand Cru vineyards that are considered to be the best for white wine in the world, right? And Montrachet is kind of the, the crown jewel. It's what we sort of call like the hope diamond in this clutch of Grand Cru vineyards, right? So Montrachet does straddle the border of the two communes, why both of them append the name of this vineyard to the name of the village itself. 3.99 hectares in Chassagne, 4.01 in Pouligny, split almost equally. The Pouligny side is technically known as Mont Rocher, and the Chassagne side is Le Mont Rocher. This is not necessarily followed by all producers, but some do choose to make this distinction on the bottle itself. Now, the Pouligny side has only five growers, so this makes it a little bit more accessible and understandable. Uh, the Chassagne side, just like its Premier Cru vineyard, is much more fragmented in Mont Rocher. Um, the first mention of the vineyard was in 1252, when it was a gift to the Abbey of Mazière. In 1483, a rent book proved that the first mention of the grapes on the Chassagne side were white. Thomas Jefferson talked about this vineyard. He made note when he traveled in France of the higher price of Mont Rocher. Dr. Laval, who was one of the, uh, really the first to begin to classify the vineyard of Burgundy in the 18th century, reckoned that no price would too high for the wine in the mid 19th century. In 1921, we took our first court action against vignerons who had been using the term Mont Rocher outside of the vineyard. Um, and this was prior to the establishment of the Appalachian system which protect producers in France, right? From things like fraud. In 1931, the Comte de Moucheron proposed that all producers of Le Mont Rocher should move to domain bottling. So it would really recognize that uh, the land here was really special for the quality of the grapes that were grown and the wine that it produced as well. So he proposed that all producers should move to domain bottling, uh, making sure to include their name and the name of the wine, Mont Rocher, on both the bottle and the cork. 
He thought there should be a minimum price agreed upon for each vintage and that there should be a general agreement to declassify the wines in a poor vintage and not label a poor vintage as Mont Rocher as the very best that Burgundy could offer, right? But unfortunately, this proposal failed. So all of the names around Le Mont Rocher, or excuse me, all of the Grand Cru vineyards around Mont Rocher do append this name to their own. And we have centuries of glowing references here, right? Um, they're just, Mont Rocher is mentioned in uh, countless works of fiction, uh, countless history books, incredibly important. The vineyard itself sits on sort of a saddle and it's exposed to both the South and the East which really we talk about this with the concept of Burgundy, right? The exposure or the aspect where the vines are planted on the slope in Burgundy are really important because in this cooler climate, it kind of allows the vine to access the power of the sun for ripening, right? We have a thin subsoil, um, has marly limestone, some clay marls. It is on a gentle slope here as well. And we usually say that Mont Rocher needs a minimum of 12 years of bottle age. It can be impenetrable when it's young, kind of like a block of stone. It can be monolithic. Um, and there's nothing worse than buyer's remorse when it comes to wine. And Mont Rocher is expensive. I was looking at some bottles today just out of curiosity. Three to eight thousand, three thousand to eight thousand dollars for a bottle of, you know, current vintage wine is not that unreasonable to see from the top producers. These are very expensive wine. Um, uh, Alan Meadows, who writes Burghound, I really like one thing he always says. Is he says, always beware of inexpensive Burgundy or especially inexpensive uh, Mont Rocher or any of the surrounding Grand Grand Cru Burgundy, because he says, with Burgundy, you may not always get what you pay for, but you will never get what you don't pay for. And that's one of the things that makes Burgundy so difficult um, and inaccessible to people is the price. And the fact that we sit here and we talk about these Grand Cru vineyards or vineyards without maybe the opportunity to ever get to drink them, right? <laughs> so who do we look for in Mont Rocher? Who's selling these $8,000 bottles of wine? Uh, Guy Amiot is here, Blaine Gagnard, Marc Foline, Florot, um, Domaine Le Fleuve is incredibly important in Chassagne. We think of Le Fleuve as being a Pouligny producer, but their, um, their plot of Mont Rocher is actually on the Chassagne side. Now, when it comes to a Grand Cru vineyard on a label of wine in Burgundy, you do not also have to list the village. The Grand Cru stands on the label on its own. So when you list Mont Rocher on your label of wine at the Grand Cru, you do not also have to list whether it comes from the Chassagne or from the Pouligny side. The vineyard itself is Le Mont Rocher. It just happens to straddle both villages itself. Uh, Chateau de Pouligny Mont Rocher, which has now been purchased, uh, we talked about this last week by uh, Etienne um, Monti, uh, Bonnet of Domaine de Monti, Comte Lafone of Marceau is here, Lamy Thio, Jacques Prior. Jacques Prior wine can be really great in terms of pricing. He owns quite a bit of vineyard land within the Cote d'Or, especially in the Grand Cru vineyard. So he's not considered to be one of the top producers, maybe because he owns so much, spread a little bit too thin, might not know all of the intricacies of these vineyards that some of these uh, smaller producers that farm only a few plots of land do. Uh, but one of the reasons I like Jacques Prior, or maybe any of the other kind of negotiate or any negotiants that you might see, uh, like Joseph Druhan, you know, Louis Latour or Louis Jadot, is the fact that because they make more wine, they can offer it at a lower price, right? So it gives us an opportunity sometimes to try wines that otherwise might be price range inaccessible to us. Uh, Domaine Romanet is here. Domaine de la Romanie Conti, coming from Rhone Romanie, is here as well. They all own a slice of the Montrachet pie um, on the Chassagne side. So in that list, I didn't include producers who own on the Pouligny side because we talked about that last week. So that would include uh, La Griche, um, whose wines are made and marketed by Joseph Druhan. That includes Bouchard, Ramonet, of course, we'll all be talking about. 
Batard Montrachet. So the first mention of Batard dates back to 1746. Uh, there are several variations of the kind of folklore around how these vineyards themselves are named. Uh, the local folk, folk, folklore um, talks about a medieval lord of Montrachet who had a bastard child as the result of a dalliance with a virgin, or Pousselle in French. So you'll notice that on the Pouligny side, there is a Premier Cru vineyard also called Pousselle. So about half of the vineyard 5.81 hectares is located in Chassagna. The rest is in Pouligny, also shared. There's a little bit of a drop um, in the road that divides the two Grand Cru vineyards of Mont Rocher and Batard. So as much as three meters at the northern end, but at the southern end near Chassagna, that drop is not as noticeable. Um, we have a the space similar geological bedrock as Mont Rocher and Beyond Venue, uh, but the topsoil in Batard is deeper and it's heavier, especially in that lower part of the vineyard. So what this does is it makes classic Batard um, a richer, fuller, more powerful, and sometimes heavier style of Grand Cru wine by comparison to something like Mont Rocher itself. Producers here, um, you're going to hear all of these same names again, but it's great when learning about Burgundy because then you begin to recognize what villages uh, some producers might be coming from, right? Le Fleve, Ramonet, Paul Pernod, Bachelet, Ramonet, Favoli, of course, the uh, negotiant, Pierre Moray, part of the Moray family, but he's located in Marceau, Jean Noel Gagnard, the Hospice de Bone makes here, Jean Marc Blaine Gagnard. Think about the Gagnard name, they're located here within Chassagna. Uh, Etienne Chave, Jean Marc Boyot, Vincent Garadine, right? We can just keep going on and on. John Chartrone, Michel Marie Coffinet, Domaine de la Romani Conti, me alone. Um, a lot of really important names. And you'll see, especially uh, Jean Marc Moray, Thomas Moray, Vincent Moray, and on and on. The Moray families are very important. Now let's talk about Creote. So Creote is the only Grand Cru that entirely located on the Chisania side. It's actually uh, more or less just about a, a hectare and a half southern extension of Batard Mont Rocher. So it has the distinction of being the smallest white Grand Cru in Burgundy. Its name is derived from the French word for chalk, which is cry. Uh, it's also the second smallest Grand Cru in all of Burgundy. So not only is it the smallest white Grand Cru, the second smallest Grand Cru, with the first one being La Romanie, the uh, monopole of Ligier Bel Air, coming from Bone Romanie. So what makes Creos unique is it does sit in a, a, a small dip or depression called a Creodet in, in France. And it collects uh, more of the heat and it can over ripen quickly. So it has the least margin of error of all of the Grand Cru vineyards when it comes to picking. Now this is important because in Burgundy, when you pick is paramount to the quality of your wines, right? When you can get a picking crew there and if you can make sure that your grapes are ripe before any impending weather comes in and, and kind of tells you that you have to pick your grapes, whether they have the ripeness that you want or not. So the flavors can be a little bit more tropical because of this, um, this small depression that they have. Uh, only four growers have enough here to make more than a single barrel of wine. So when we look at the bottom, we're gonna look at um, Davernay, Hubert Lamy, uh, Blanc du Don. Like they all have about 0 0.06, 0 0.05, you know, 0.05 of a hectare. This is in a good vintage, one barrel of wine or less. So if you're thinking I rarely ever see Creole, Batard, and Mont Rocher, there's a reason for that. There's very little of this wine made. And that also makes it difficult to really uh, kind of analyze the style of Creole itself due to this. It does have more stone and a bit less clay than uh, Batard directly to its north. The wines are a little bit more elegant um, and slightly less rich. They tend to be a little bit less long, uh, less long lived than we see in Batard. So we talked about that kind of tropical fruit, but they can still be elegant like Beyond Venue, which is the Northern extension Grand Cru of Batard, right? And Creote is the Southern extension of the Grand Cru of Beyond. Creote, Batard, Mont Rocher, Beyond Venue, Batard, Mont Rocher. 
Um, again, always fun to look at maps. So you can see, so if we're going this way, sort of to the right of the screen, this would be kind of more or less north, right? And then we have a uh, Creote here and you can see the plot of land that they have. So this is also an interesting way to look at the plot of land because um, the plots are contiguous here, which is not always that common in other places. Let's think about some Premier Cruz. Premier Cruz are always a lot of fun. So we're going to go through, we've got to go through these pretty quickly. 55 to talk about, not all are important, but I think that it helps us to understand what we're looking for and why we might see these terms, these LIUD, right? These named parcels of land um, that are named both for taxation purposes, but then also picked out as being um, singular in their expression of wine. So Blanchot de Sou uh, is considered to be one of the best of the Premier Cru. It sits at the foot of Les Mont Rocher. It's a prime vineyard site, even if the land itself is a relatively flat by comparison to the Grand Cru or some of the other Premier Cru's. Um, it's in the northeast corner. It touches both Les Mont Rocher and Creotes. Um, it had the most evident south slope and kind of the best corner. And so you can see my, um, <laughs> so it's kind of hard to see on this map here. I don't want to like put my face too close to the camera, but you can see uh, Blanchot de Sous just at the end of uh, Creotes and Le Mont Rocher over here. Darby O'Coren, Coffinet Duvernay, which we'll talk about today, Jean Noël Gagnard, Marie Coffinet, and Jean Claude Bachelet are all important producers. Uh, Vid Bors, the downslope continuation of uh, Batard, just over here, otherwise surrounded by village level vineyards. Heavier soil, but it does still have small stones that give us a little bit of drainage. And it's important because Vid Bors is kind of considered um, almost like a petite Batard. It tends to be ready to drink earlier than the Grand Cru, and it doesn't age quite as long, um, but it's quite small. One important thing about the all of the Premier Cru's of Chassagna is they tend to be less expensive overall than the Premier Cru's of either Pouligny or Merceau, a little bit further to the north as well. Uh, and Remai is a little bit further to the north, so it's actually on the border of um, what we would say over here is, is uh, Chevalier Mont Rocher to the north of Les Mont Rocher. It's a very excellent site. It has uh, very little topsoil, so it really tends to be um, good in wetter years um, when we can keep the vine just a little bit drier as well. So here we can see Mont Rocher, Grand Cru, Batard Mont Rocher, Creole Batard Mont Rocher, all three Grand Cru's, and Blanchot de Sous. So this is the Premier Cru that we talked about first. Is that This is that uh, north east corner that tends to be the best with the, the most, the steepest slope right there within this vineyard here. Um, over here, we have the village level of Blancho de Souf, which we're going to talk about in a second. So how do you tell the difference on a label? In many villages, uh, a single vineyard can be classified as both Premier Cru and village level. So you might notice that and look for either the presence or the absence of the term Premier Cru to tell you whether that's a village level wine or a Premier Cru level wine. And it won't be like you can call this either. It's like they're adjacent vineyard. This part is village and this part is Premier Cru. Uh, Dent de Chien, uh, high up on the slopes, you can barely even see it on this map, these two little corners. So this entire white spot is Dente Chien, but because it's mostly naked bedrock, it's very difficult to plant. So there's just a few planted corners at the moment here. A slice of this was actually incorporated into Le Mont Rocher um, as well. It shows a very similar style to Chevalier Mont Rocher. So a very mineral driven, palette to the wine. It tends to be very stony. Sometimes people say Chevalier is like rolling small pebbles around in your mouth. Um, and But they really is a, a, an homage to the incredible minerality of this wine as well. Les Bondus, um, it's often declared as its neighbor, 
chenevote, if we talked about, especially if planted with Chardonnay. The stony soils, or excuse me, the heavier soils are more suitable within Bondu to Pinot Noir. So you'll see that when producers want to produce or want to make Chardonnay from this vineyard, they'll usually call it chenevote because that kind of gives the consumer the idea that, hey, this is a better, a better white wine, right? Les Combes on the northern edge of Chenevotes, which you can see over here. So this is Les Combes over here. Um, so just on the northern edge, a thin slice. Uh, Jean Ricard is a favorite Burgundy negotiant of mine. He makes uh, a really great old vine version from purchased grapes out of this vineyard, but otherwise you rarely see it declared. Most producers will sell it as Chenevote rather than Les Combes. Chenevote's the relatively flat land. It's a cooler site, um, so it tends to do pretty well, as we mentioned, for Chardonnay. Probably was grown to hemp here in the, in the path, which leads to one of the names. You can look for wine from either uh, the Colleen or the Moray family. Both do really well here. Le Pasquel is a subsector of Verger. Uh, Philippe Bouzerou is the only producer currently to declare a separate wine. Petit Dure, the northern part of Verger against the border of Saint Aubin. Uh, currently, no producers are labeling it separately, but you might see that happen in the future. Le Verger, the east facing vineyard, can be a really fantastic source, as you can see here, for uh, white wine. It has a little bit of a lighter soil than uh, Chevenotes or Mascherelles, but a little bit flatter than Chaumet, which is just above it. So the wines tend to be a little bit more lean in the youth, but they do develop a bit more fleshiness with their age as well. So again, look for anything from the Colleen family, the Pio family, Ramone is making wine here, Amio and Marc Moray. Just above Le Chaumet, you can see to the on the map, it would actually be to the west, but towards the top of the map is it located on, on here as we look at it. At the northern edge of the village on the road leading to Saint Aubin, just, just west, a really great source um, for pretty complex white wines and tend to be pretty vibrant uh, in their minerality as well. Noticeable slope with uh, stonier soils here also. Great producers are Dublair and John Noel Gagnards. So Maturel Chassagna, Rebuche, Close St. John. So Close St. John, as we mentioned, is really an area that's renowned for the quality of the Pinot Noir and the red wines that are made from here. There is um, a formal clo, Close St. John. Um, so it's called Chassagna du Close St. John. We have a little bit more iron in the soil, which give it a notably red color here as well. Mikel Nialone makes fantastic white wine here, but I think one of the crown jewels of Clos St. John is coming from uh, Domaine Ramonet, something that you can certainly look for in the Premier Cru sector. We said kind of earlier that Clos St. John really produces one of the uh, best styles, I think, of Pinot Noir that we really do find within the village of Chisania. So they tend to be slightly lighter in color, but they have a lot more finesse to them. They tend to have um, better integrated tannins, a softness to them that we don't find within Morgeau or Maltroy. And they tend to have a lot of uh, fresh fruit that they retain. They're capable of a lot longer aging than we see in red wine coming from some of the other places within the village itself. So you can see Close St. John just up here as well. So Chassagne Close St. John, uh, Close St. John, Muray and Rebiche are all listed in the previous one, but as I mentioned, Unfortunately, we just can't go over every single, <laughs> every single of the 55 Premier Cruz. I feel, sorry guys, I feel like a little bit like, all I'm doing is just like repeating these things because there's so much to say. And um, I hope that it's making sense and it's a little bit more fun for you than I'm, I'm thinking it might be. So Le Marais, also important to discuss, single it out on its own because it's a monopole of Fontaine Gagnard. They produce uh, white wines, even though it is part of Close St. John, which is more commonly known for the red, as we've mentioned before. Um, it is one of the part of the vineyard uh, closest to the houses. 
uh, as Kretz is rarely seen separately, kind of located a little bit further um, down here to the western side, or excuse me, to the eastern side. Bruno Colleen produces um, both a white and a red wine from Ez Kretz that he releases as a neighboring vineyard, uh, Maltroy. Laplace, one of the four D that make up Premier Cru Maltroy, so just below Chateau, uh, Chateau de la Maltroy, would talk about currently not being declared separately either. And then La Matroy is quite important. So you can see it's a larger vineyard in terms of the hectares, right? The size that we actually plant the grapes to, so 11.6. Um, it's a large enclosed vineyard, um, the Liu D itself of four hectares, but because we can name the surrounding vineyards of the same, it makes it 11.6. So the southern half, is the Clos de la Maltroy, which is owned by Guy Amio, uh, making primarily red wine, uh, Joel, John Noel Gagnard, making primarily white wine, and Mikel Nialone, who makes white and red wine. And then the Clos du Chateau de la Maltroy is the northern half. So it's owned by the Chateau itself, making both white and red. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a moment, um, or towards the end when we talk about producers. So Chassagne Laplace is Kretz, all currently can bottle as Maltroy. I told you it was gonna be a little bit confusing, right? So Le Champ Gain, located just in the center of the village, um, a little bit more at the mid slope, as you can see here, neighboring the village level vineyards. Um, it's been, um, Sorry, I'm looking at my notes and sometimes I'm trying to make sense of them. So warm, well-protected, has a relatively rich soil. Um, I remember now what I was trying to say. So uh, Le Champ Gain, so essentially it's a, a kind of an interesting name here, mean, meaning extra gain or extra profit. So they said that prior there was probably hay that was planted here. It's supposed to say it was such a fine field that they said that hay could be harvested twice a harvest for an extra gain or an extra profit, which is um, related to the name of the vineyard itself. So noted for red by Dr. Laval in the 19th century, but today primarily planted to white wine, but it does make a more opulent style, tends to be ready for earlier consumption than some of the other Premier crews that are higher up on the slope. Vin Derrier, uh, it's a sizable chunk of the larger Cairo village. Cairo, excuse me, vineyard. Cairo is one of the best that we find within the village itself. It sits right behind the village. That reflects it in the name. Sometimes the name can be really fun here. But Cairo is a much, uh, much better known marketing tool. Um, so because of the name, Vin Derrier, people that are making or growing grapes within that vineyard do tend to label it as Cairo instead. Uh, Le Combar, the teeny tiny part right here up at the very top of the slope, um, abutting the two village vineyards. Um, tiny part of Cairo uh, always sold as its own bottling because the quality of this particular tiny slice, 0.65 of a hectare, is considered to be really fantastic. So they never incorporate it into Cairo. They always bottle it separately as Le Combard. We have John, no John Noel Gagnard and Cofine Duvernay are making wine out of Combard. Cairo covered the subdivisions of Encaire, Chassagne, Le Combard, and Vigne Derriere, which we were talking about higher up on the slope from the village itself. Um, as all vineyard named Cairo, it talks about or denotes a stony soil with very little earth. These are vineyards that when we see this name, we should expect uh, a more intense minerality than we might see in other vineyards. Today it's implanted entirely with white grapes. There's no red remaining. It tends to be a little closed off in its youth, but really develops a lot of complexity, more minerality. It tends to be very finessed, um, sort of reaching towards the quality of the Grand Cru, but it doesn't quite have the intensity or the weight. Uh, some producers really say that it's important to blend the different parts of the Cairo village, or excuse me, I confuse village and vineyard, the Cairo vineyard, so that you can get a more complete version of the wine of what the vineyard itself can make. So to help make a much more balanced style of Cairo than just using one plot. 
Uh, Ramone is here, Pierre-Yves Colleen is here, Jean-Marc Moray, Bernard Moray, Alex is making the wine now, Moray Coffinet, and on and on. So let's um, think about, I think probably skipping a few so we get closer to Morgeau, since we have a lot to talk about there. Um, but let's, let's focus for a second. So Le Guan Rousseau, um, really important vineyard higher up on the slope with uh, Caillere and La Romanée, kind of considered to be two of the best, uh, uh, one of the three best that are higher up on the mid slope. So Grand Rousseau is part of La Grande Montagne, but sold under its own name because again, much like uh, Combard, the quality of this little slice is considered to be really fantastic. Um, refers to the small stones, but perhaps well, beehive as well, where it gets its name. This is really white wine territory as we're higher up on the slope. You can see the, the top heart here, further towards the west, but higher on the slope. Considered to be one of the best uh, white wine vineyards in all of Chisania. Obviously, we think about the Grand Cruz first, but this is uh, really one of the top premier crews that you'll see. You look for the wine from uh, Ramonet, Bernard Moreau, Pio, and uh, there's also quite a few negotiant bottles. So for some of the vineyards, especially even like Creotes, even though it's a Grand Cru, one of the producers has enough of the wine, uh, enough of grape that he sells them. So you more often see negotiant bottling in Creotes as well. Do you see them every year? No, but you might see them some years. Now, one of the other things that's really confusing about, um, but important to note, about why you don't just go to a producer's website and be like, well, in 2008, the, they labeled the wine as Morgeau, but it came from a blend of Rousseaux and Boudriot. Because every year that blend can change a little bit depending on the conditions of that year, right? Burgundy is so vintage dependent and based on where your vineyard is on the slope, um, one might do better in one year than others. So the blend is never the same year to year. So also important that the quantity of the wine made because of that is also never the same from year to year. Uh, Boudriot is another large vineyard that has several smaller vineyards under it. Uh, Jasper Morris notes that Boudriot is a marvelous opportunity for Burgundian confusion, as if there wasn't enough to begin with. It can be sold as Morgeau or it can be labeled as five other Liu D that might be sold as Boudriot or Morgeau itself. So the parcel known as Boudriot is actually just over two hectares itself. And some producers, and this is what we were sort of just getting at, can make multiple bottling. So Ramone, for example, makes Morgeau coming from Morgeau itself. He also makes Boudriot white that actually comes from Ferrandez and he makes the red Claude de la Boudriot from the actual 2.22 hectares of Boudriot itself. Uh, the whites tend to be a little bit more floral, um, elegant, they have a finer core of acidity than we see within the Morgot white. And I think that's important and that's why producer would choose to separate out Boudriot as opposed to labeling it as Morgot. The red tend to be a little bit more concentrated, not as tannic as you might see with the other red Chassagne coming from La Boudriot or coming from the Clos de La Boudriot, which is um, a really important bottling of Ramonato. So Champ Gindru, Le Chom, Gruchier, and Ez Croats are also all able to be labeled as either Boudriot or Morgeau. Now they do tend to have more of these uh, kind of richer, more compact, compact clay soils. So it makes sense that we might see that labeled because they're much smaller vineyards as well. And you know, Morgeau is a really well-known Premier Cru vineyard. It helps producers who have vines within these smaller vineyards to be able to label them at the larger Morgeau, right? So you might see producers declare these as themselves, but then a couple of them like John Drew and Gruchier are currently not declared on their own. Um, they're just labeled under the larger premier crew of Morgeau. Vin Blanche, Roquemore, 
uh, Petite Ferrandez. So we talked, we kind of skipped over, but we talked a little bit about Ferrandez before, right? Boudriot, uh, Ramone Boudriot comes from Ferrande. Uh, Le Petit Clo and La Romani. So out of these five vineyards, La Romani, also part of Le Grand Montan, just like Rouchot, like Grand Rouchot. Also one of the more important Premier Cru vineyards to discuss. So has a little bit of size, of size to it, which is great, over three hectares, really tend to deliver exceptional elegance, even though it is much higher up on the slope. Um, it's really protected by a, a strand of trees that's here from the northern wind, and the grapes do tend to ripen a little bit on the early side. So this protection, this acidity that we have within the wine uh, tend to give us this flesh, this structure uh, with a core of minerality. It makes uh, La Romani, a very complete wine in terms of a white that comes from one of the Premier Cru vineyards. So you can look for really great examples from Maury Coffinet, Vincent Dancer, Paul Pio, Louis Jadeau is here as well, the Negociant Fontaine Gagnard, and the Chateau de la Maltroy are all making great examples. Uh, Roque Muir is important because it's a monopole of a producer coming from Santenay. So Santenay is the village just south of Chassania here. Fun stuff, we're almost through the Premier Cruise, I promise, I promise you. Uh, Bois de Chim uh, Chassania, um, not released on its own at the moment. Um, however, we only know of like two producers that are actually located in the Bois de Chassania. Um, and there's like five hectares of, of Premier Cru land that's just unaccounted for here. So I don't know who, farming the grapes and like kind of selling those grapes to somebody else. Uh, the Tet du Clove and Dancer, the main producer to offer this as a separate bottling. I think we have a photo of that later on. Uh, Le Grand Clove planted to both Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, uh, a kind of a pretty substantial upper block of Morgeau, but you rarely do see it under its own name. Uh, La Chapelle in the lower section of Morgeau and Boirette, also lower on the slope. Um, it's not declared as its own name, but Vincent Moray Morgeau and the base of Jean Noel Gagnard Morgeau both come from the Le Boirette subsection as well. Morgeau, almost 60 hectares. Why is that? Because we just named anywhere between, so again, just like there's depending on the publication, between 19 and 55 Premier Cruz within Chisania, there's anywhere between something like 15 and 22 Premier Cruz that can make up the block of Premier Cru vineyard that you can label as Morjo. Um, so I have a list of some of those here, most that we talked about, Boudreau, Ferrandez, Le Grand Born, um, and so forth are listed here. Clo Petoy is also a monopole vineyard. I think that's on the, um, the next slide. Morgeau had much greater fame in the, in the 19th century than it necessarily does have today. So much of it has been replanted to white grapes when a lot of these lower slopes, as we mentioned, really might be better for the production of Pinot Noir. But a great Morgeau Blanc should have weight, it should have power, it should have the ability to um, age a very long time in the cellar and develop more complexity as it ages as well. But as you can see, because of this uh, huge area, this nearly 60 hectares of this Premier Cru, and all of the subsections that can be labeled as Morgeau or not, consistency, consistency and quality do tend to suffer. So there's a little bit of work to be done to rehabilitate the reputation of this Premier Cru. And that's why the subsections actually become important because during this you've probably been like Amber why are you telling me about all of these 55 Premier Crews because eventually the work to be done to kind of rehabilitate um, these different plots of land will be letting the consumer know why these individual plots are important and different and then because producer, producer, producer is so important in Burgundy, we're telling you which of the best producers are in which Liu D, right? Which part of what subsection of the Premier Cru vineyards do these important producers have? So you might look for, you know, you might start looking at the Morais or the Pios or the Collines, and you might start looking for these uh, different vineyards that you do see. 
So I think we should move on to um, a couple of the village LUD. We only have a few to talk about. So um, there's a few white wine villages um, that are village, excuse me, vineyards that are village level that cling to the hillside up here at the top of the slope. So you can see pop. Uh, Pat Bois is really the most important that we see here listed down here at the bottom. We have Blanchot de Sioux, which we discussed over here, um, sort of that, you know, sort of southern extension of Creots over here, which I have covered right, and then the Blanchot de Sioux Premier Cru up here, Blanchot de Sioux uh, Village level vineyard down here. Um, if you are taking an exam, right, an oral exam for someone like the quartermaster sommelier, they might say something like, uh, I want to have a wine coming from Blanchot de Sioux. Do you have a producer on your list? And you might have to ask them to spell that, right? Are they saying Blanchot de Sioux Premier Cru or are they asking for the village level wine? Now, you might know that uh, Cofine Duvernay actually makes both Premier Cru and village level. So that would be a safe answer for you, right? Um, we also look at Le Chen uh, Ensignier, which is a village level vineyard right on the border of the Pouligny Premier Cru Ensignier as well. Pierre Yves Colline makes wine coming out of this area. Le Mazor can also be important. And um, why do we think about these? you know, village level LUD. Well, here they're not as important. I mean, just the sheer number of premier crews that we have in Chisania almost negates the village level vineyard, right? But it's interesting to know that many producers, rather than blending grapes from all over the village for the village level, might still show the imprint of terroir by sourcing all of their grapes from a single village LUD, right? Um, so that's important in like Les Mazures, Jean Noel Gagnard and Pio declare this as their village wine. So it still is a very terroir driven wine as well. All right, let's talk about some producers. I'm not gonna keep you much longer. Um, and I think, you know, getting to, hi Fancat, I didn't think you come on. <laughs> So talk a little bit about the producers. Um, it can be really difficult here. So I like to say if you see a Moray or a Colleen, a Cofine, a Gagnard or a Pilo or a Pio, they come from Chosanya. So when you see any of these producers on a label of wine, most likely they're in Chisania or one of the very nearby neighboring villages. We might think Sanoban, we might think Santene, we might think Pouligny or Merceau, but really in that kind of southern sector of the Côte Um, So we'll talk about some of these family trees, but other producers you might look for would be uh, Guy Amio, so an important producer run by the third and fourth generation. Terry is the main winemaker today. They have a really strong portfolio of Chassagna Premier Cruz. And one of the great things here is that if you want to see the difference in these Premier Cruz, there are a lot of opportunities to do so. You have a lot of producers that make, you know, six, seven, eight different Premier Cruz within their portfolio. So you can really see one producer's expression of each of these Premier Cruz. Um, they have a very small slice of Mont Rocher as well. Uh, Bachelet, Ramonet, they make a really fantastic uh, La Boudriot Rouge or red wine. They have vines both in Batard Mont Rocher and Beyond Venue Batard Mont Rocher entirely on the Pouligny side. We have the Marquis de la Guiche. Um, now, it's a really interesting family story. They owned a very significant portion of Le Mont Rocher prior to the revolution. Um, Many of the Lagriche um, were unfortunately were executed during the revolution, but when the family did emerge afterwards, they still owned half the vineyards. And today they are the largest uh, owners of uh, Mont Rocher today. So they own about two hectares of the entire eight hectare vineyard. That includes both sides of Pouligny and Chassagna. Um, but Joseph Druhan vinifies and matures the wine, but he sells it under the Lagriche label. So you can see Joseph Druhan and also the Lagriche name here. Uh, Blaine Gagnard as well. So we're gonna talk about more of the Gagnards in a moment, but John Mark Blaine and, and Claudine Gagnard, a lot of the 
you know, um, marriages create estates with these names. Their children go off, start their own estate. They use the, the family name as well, which is how the surname within Burgundy and especially in, Ch in Chassagne end up becoming so convoluted. Um, but these are really styles of wine that John Mark really pursues a lot of elegance um, as opposed to power. Their son, Mark uh, Antonin, has studied in Australia and New Zealand, has also joined the, the family winery as well. He tends to be um, quite uh, quiet in his use of new oak, 10 to 15% for the village and premier crew level, 30% for the Grand Cru. Um, he's making wine in Boudriot, Tire, a two of his best vineyards, uh, Batard Montrachet, Creole Batard Montrachet, as well as white and red and some of the other premier crews as well. Uh, Vincent Dancer, the first to set up his domain in his family in 1996, even though his family had owned uh, vineyards for several generations. So he's a fanatic for low yield. He creates impactful styled wine. Um, they have a lot of fleshy fruit, but they also really retain this beautiful, pure minerality to the wines as well. Um, his Tête du Clos is the only producer to offer this Premier Cru from vines planted in 1954. It has exotic fruit, but it really is still fine and very complex as well. Uh, Lemmy Pio is uh, not related to the other Pio. So this is really one of the only exceptions where uh, the name Pio is not related to the family Pio of Chassagne, which we'll be talking about. So the Gagnard family, uh, initially coming from Volnay, but really one of uh, Chassagne's greatest 20th century characters. So his daughter married Jacques Gagnard. They had two daughters. Lawrence married Richard Fontaine and Claudine married John Mark Blaine. Why do we say all of these things? Because it helps us understand, again, the family tree of Chassagne. So Jacques Gagnard's brother, John Noel Gagnard, developed his own domain Today is run by his daughter, Carolyn. So anytime you see John Noel Gagnard, the name of the winery itself, by his daughter, uh, Carolyn Lestime, makes the wine today. So we have both uh, Fontaine Gagnard and John Noel Gagnard as well. The John Noel Gagnard wines um, are really considered to be fantastic styles of wine. Uh, Carolyn had really increased the holdings of land and a lot of the premier crew holdings. So they really give us a great opportunity again to compare different premier crews within Chassagne through the lens of a single producer. Um, they really tend to empathize, uh, emphasize a little bit more of that fruit rather than the tannins, especially in their red wines. The Cofine family, we're going to talk a little bit more about them when we talk about the Morays. So they're not as widespread as the Colleen and the Moray tribes, um, but they're also linked to the Morays and the P.O. Cecile P.O., who is the sister of Paul, we're going to talk about, married Fernand Cofine. Uh, Fabienne married Michael Moray. They have domain Moray Cofine, which we're going to talk about with the Morays, so it's not listed here. And Laura Cofine created Cofine Duvernay with her partner, Philippe. Um, so this is, Cofine Duvernay is really um, a, a very small production winery. Uh, the wines, are, the winery is based in Fernand Cofine's old winery right in the center of the village. They have six hectares that are divided equally between red and white. Uh, Les Blanchot de Sioux, Les Maltroy, Caillere, and Bertard Montrachet are the most important wines that they make. But the Les Blanchot de Sioux, which we'll talk about in a few moments, is really one of the, the best wines that they have coming out of Chassagne as well. So in the Colleen family, we really trace it back to when Bernard, Marc, and Michael Colleen de, de, uh, de Leger retired. So Marc Colleen, the winery, is run today by his three of his children, Carolyn, Joseph, and Damien. His oldest son, Pierre Yves, started his own winery with his wife, Pierre Yves Colleen Moray, right? With his wife, Caroline Moray, or Caroline Moray. Michael Colleen de Leger, vineyards were distributed to his son, Philip and Bruno. So they work separately. So you see Philippe Colleen and Bruno Colleen. They're each their own wineries. And you can kind of see over here in the margins, we have some examples of those labels. And then you see Pierre-Yves 
Colleen. So his name is Pierre Yves Colleen. The winery itself is called Pierre Yves Colleen Moray. It's both a domain and a negotiant project. Started as a negotiant project with his wife in um, like 2001, I think that they established the negotiant label. When he left the family domain in 2005, he had six hectares of vineyards that were his that he took with him. We think about the concept of the the burgundy, you know, fracturization of vineyard. Um, each each son or daughter taking their share of the inheritance with them if they decide to go out and start their own brand. And his techniques have really evolved since he left the family domain. Um, he really concerned about the issues of uh, premature oxidation. So he doesn't perform batonage. He doesn't heat the cellar to encourage malolactic fermentation. He keeps the wine in barrels longer. And this makes a very singular style of white burgundy. So we oftentimes say that the, the we call it PYCM. So that's like the one of the wine lingos, right? Pierre Yves Colleen Moray, you hear somebody say PYCM, they're talking about this guy and his winery. The styles tend to be um, a little bit more on the reductive side. So you'll get a little bit more of like kind of a, a flint or matchstick style when you open the wine especially when they're young. I really think that, you know, it's a shame because in New York, the PYCM wines um, get snapped up so quickly because um, they're, they're so popular and there's very little of it made. They get snapped up and they get drunk because they get put on a list. Nobody has room to keep anything in New York. And they really oftentimes are drunk just a little bit too young. So if you get your hands on some PYCM, um, it's not expensive especially at like the village of the premier crew level. He also makes like, you know, regional level, just white burgundy style too. If you get your hands on some, it will be hard, but see if you can just put it away in your, whatever constitutes as your cellar. Put it away for a few years. I got my hands on a few years ago, some PYCM Aligote 2017, and I just have it just waiting, just waiting for a better time. So Chateau de la Maltroy, Another important producer, they have the, um, the monopole, the Clodu Chateau de la, de la Maltroy, as we mentioned before as well. They are in the Premier Crew of Maltroy. They're the only one that are allowed to spell it with a Y instead of an I on the label itself because it reflects their name as well. One of those burgundy, um, you know, kind of burgundy side notes that they were able to petition to be like, well, that's our name. This is how we've been spelling it. And tradition almost always wins out in burgundy as well. Um, they do just stem their reds, which is pretty common within Chisania. And um, because the wine can have a little rusticity to them, we don't see producers oftentimes using stems like we might see in, you know, um, the Côte Nui, a little bit further north in places like Bone Romani. They're making Batard Montrachet. They're making uh, La Dente Chien. We talked about the Monopole Vineyard already. We talked, they're making uh, La Romani, the longest lasting of their Premier Cruz, really intense minerality because of that higher location up on the slope as well. And I really love the simplicity of their new label. So we have two of those on here and then um, uh, an older version of their labels as well. So both of these are the Monopole Premier Cruz, but you can see that producers can change their labels, right? To keep up with changing times. Bernard Moreau, um, today Alex is the winemaker. Um, so we have Alex and Benoit are both the winemakers, but Alex is really kind of pushing it into the new style. It's more clean cut. Um, it uh, doesn't have a lot of overpowering oak. It is there, it's slightly noticeable, but they tend to be much more polished. They only use about 5% new wood for the red wine. They really wanna show the fruit of the Pinot Noir coming from this area as well. So Alex is really doing some great things here. It's softer, um, a, a, a more precise style than his father used to make. So the Moray family is like the senior clan of Chasania. Like this is, this is the family, right? Um, Pierre Moray of Merceau is part of this family. Um, Albert Moray, the father of Bernard and John Mark. Bernard Moray, the father of Vincent and Thomas, 
Marc Moret, the father of Michel Moret Coffiné, and Marie Joseph, who married Bernard Moland, they run the Marc Moret domain today. We have Michel Moret Coffiné, Vincent Moret married Sophie, and we have Thomas Moret. So we have a little bit of, um, uh, you know, kind of a fun, and then, um, you know, we have uh, Carolyn Moray, the daughter of John Mark Moray, who married Pierre Eves Colleen, right? P Y C M. Pierre Eves Colleen married um, Carolyn Moray. That's why the winery is called Pierre Eves Colleen Moray. So Bernard Moray divided um, his vineyard between his sons, Vincent and Thomas. His last vintage was in 2006, but you will still see these wines floating around, of course. There, his style was much uh, fuller. He was a fan of releasing magnums of his favorite vineyards several years after bottling. You see some of those around and they're within your price range, could be something really fun to try. Uh, Jean-Marc Moret is the brother of Bernard, so the uncle to Thomas and Vincent set up his own domain after his father's retirement, um, tends to use about 25% new oak on his wine, bottled after about 12 months. Marc Moret retired in 1987. Uh, his son, Michel, took over, um, took his share of the vineyard. And as we mentioned, his daughter and his son-in-law uh, really run the, the vineyard, the winery itself, domain Marc Moret now, along with his granddaughter, Sabine, who's taking over too today. And then Thomas Moret, he has his grandfather's cellar in Chassania and about nine hectares of vines located over six different communes. So he's not just working within Chisanya. He's also working with grapes from other villages as well. We also have Vincent and Sophie. So son of Bernard, brother of Thomas, married to Sophie. They have their own label, Domain Vincent and Sophie Moray. You can see their names on the label over here. Uh, Michael Moray Cofiné. So the son of Marc Moray, married to a Cofiné, which we're gonna talk about. You noticed that we talked about this winery under the Cofinades as well. And now Carolyn Moray as well also started her own domain. So separate from her husband, Pierre Eves Colleen, in 2014, she started her own domain and she is working with some of the premier crew vineyards like Tyret and Champagne within Chassagne as well. The last family, and then we're going to talk about Ramonet, and then I'm going to let you guys go. So the Pilo family, also really important. John Mark Pio labels are uh, very recognizable with the blue and the yellow. I think that they look they look really um, really sharp, really crisp and clean. I like. We don't buy wine by the label, but you always appreciate a good looking label, right? Domain Paul Pio, also really important. Uh, joined by two of his children, uh, Terry and Crystal. Terry is really making the wine today. They're very um, white wine focused. They aid their reds in about a third new wood as well. They're working with, again, many of the premier crews that you see within the village itself. And then also Domaine Ramonet. So, um, you know, Ramonet has been along for a long time. Pierre Ramonet is a legend um, for the quality really of his wine, uh, but he was very eccentric in his character as well. Now it's really been his, um, the next generation after his son, uh, Noel and John Claude, that have really taken over the domain and done some really fantastic things with it as well. So they are, I would say, the most consistently exciting reds, especially within Chisania. The quality of their whites is also absolutely fantastic. But if you want to look for um, wines, red wines that are really well made, that are maybe not as expensive as the Premier Cru coming from the Côte Nui. I definitely look for the Ramonet Chassagne Rouge. So they're great value on restaurant list, especially in Burgundy itself. The whites can be pretty tense. Um, they can be sort of closed when you first smell them, but they're really wines that we like to say sort of reward the patient drinker. They will blossom, they'll open up in the bottle, and definitely in the glass with time. Um, the Premier Cru Rouchot is one of the best that they make. White wine dating back, the vine date back to 1934. Um, really has a great density of fruit and texture and flavor to it. The Ramonet whites uh, really tend to have, like we talked earlier about some of that kind of almost um, um, 
like resinous quality that you can get to the wine, both the reds and the whites of Chassagna. And these wines really exemplify that too. Um, certainly look for their, uh, the Boudriot red, Morgeau, they make red, the Clos Saint John, they make red as well. All right, so the last thing we're gonna talk about is the two wines. And then I'm gonna let you guys go. So you can always cut the recording later if you have to jump off earlier. So we always wanna pick, um, we've been really trying to pick a selection of different vintages that you could see if you ordered the wine for all of these classes, uh, different uh, levels within the villages. Of course, both of these wines are coming from Chassagna today. Um, we're really excited about the wine coming from Bachelet Mono. Uh, Mark and Alexan or Alex Bachelet oversee this domain. So they started in 2005 with a combination of family land and long-term leases that they took over. Their grandfather had founded Bernard Bachelet uh, in Chassagna. Their father worked there, so they do come from a winemaking family. They come from six different parcels within um, the village level of Chassagna. All of the vines are 30 plus years old. They're using indigenous yeast. The wines are aged for about 12 months in 20% new, but large barrels. So larger than ones that you would normally see within Burgundy. And then the six months in tank before release. So they're really looking at the quality of these wines. Um, there was lower volumes in 2017. You're seeing this a lot. Um, as the weather, weather becomes more and more erratic. But in 2017, what did remain was a very good quality. So we had a pretty cool summer and much cooler nights. And this gave us um, a much higher than usual acidity. But the harvest conditions allowed us to really um, pick healthy and ripe fruit. So even though the yields are down quite a bit, which is usually one of the biggest problems in Burgundy, the quality of the wine was quite good. So Coffinet Duvernay, we talked about this, right? Laura um, and Philippe married a Duvernay and a Coffinet. Uh, so Laura Coffinet comes from a family that had been making wine in Chassagna since the mid 1800s. Uh, when her and Philippe started their winery, she brought her share of the vineyard from her family's vineyard with her as well. The uh, Le Blancho de Sioux is one of the top wines. Uh, Philippe referred to it as the Pied de Mont Rocher, the foot of Mont Rocher, as we mentioned before, that uh, premier cru vineyard that's just south of Le Mont Rocher itself. So the style here, I think, definitely lends to a wine that needs a little bit more time to open up. They make the wine in a little bit of that PYCM style that we talked about earlier on with. Um, less batonage, less stirring of the leaves that gives us that richer, more buttery character. Um, so you might get when you open this a little bit more of that slight uh, reduction, um, a little bit of that matchstick character, but that quality really should blow off as the wine opens up. So when it's it made without oxygen and sometimes it really needs to take a breath to kind of uh, shake off that sort of um, kind of flinty or matchstick characteristic that it can have to it. So 2013 was also a difficult year. Oftentimes, I mean, there's not a lot of like not difficult years in Burgundy, but um, they wanted a bigger crop than 2012, but they just didn't have it. It was a cold spring. It was a very erratic summer. And 2013 wines, um, you really need to look for some of the top producers, which is what we're doing here. So. Coffinet Duvernay, uh, Blanchot de Sousse Premier Cru, 2013. I think it's really fantastic also. We think about the Chassagne Premier Cru. Do you usually want to drink them? I would, I would almost say between like, you know, kind of five and 10 years of age. And we're, we're really right at um, hopefully a really peak spot for this. Thank you, guys. That was a lot. Um, Venkat, when you get to review this we went over 55 premier crews <laughs> that's great though i'll uh yeah i, I joined at like 7 15 so I'll, i'm gonna watch the recording again no problem um thank you yeah that was a that was a lot of fun i hope that again you know the point really is to help you take this information and steer your studies in a way that is uh better for you to understand how to 
began to take risk on buying and accessing Burgundy because there's a lot to learn. Um, and Chassagne, there's much less information about Chassagne than about places like Pouligny and Merceau. Um, but I, I hope that we were able to um, kind of take some of that information and, and make it more digestible. Great. Thank you. Guys. That was very good. I, I, it was, I learned a lot. <laughs> good. I'm glad to hear that. All right. Well, as always, let me know if you have questions. And Thanks, I really hope Amber. you enjoy your Friday. This has been a great series on Burgundy. What's that? I was just saying this has been a great series on Burgundy. I'm glad to hear that. I think we're gonna maybe do more of an in-depth champagne next when we when we go back to virtual classes in September. So sounds great. Good. Yeah, Ryan was saying that. That's that sounds exciting. Oh good. Okay, good. I'm glad he mentioned it. All right, yeah, we'll keep your eye out. We'll have the class calendar um, hopefully up in the next week or so for September. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye. Have a good, good weekend. Bye. Thanks.